who I'd like to introduce, Coltrane Stansbury. Um, he is what I call our DEI guru here at Macmillan Learning. Um, and he's going to give a quick overview of what he does at Macmillan and our corporate practices for diversity, equity, and inclu inclusion. Hopefully, to give you all some ideas on how corporate DEI practices can be instituted and maybe used at your own institution. So Coltrane, take it away. Thanks so much, Andrea. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, once again, I'm Coltrane Stansbury, the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Macmillan Learning. And I'm pleased to be here just to give a brief overview of the work that we've been doing so far around diversity, equity, inclusion at the company. Um, so I got aboard, came aboard uh, in February of this year um, with a mandate of helping to create a um, inclusive strategy for D DEI for the company and um, covering all the comprehensive areas of, of our work. Uh, in doing so, um, there are a couple things that I observed uh, coming into my role as challenges and as opportunities. Um, you know, first in terms of challenges with the work, you know, we wanted to make sure that we observed our environment in terms of being conducive to do this over time. We found out that we've got a diffuse system of accountability when I came aboard at the company. Um, DEI wasn't currently a part of a mandate in terms of people's roles and responsibilities, it was done as a volunteer function. Uh, also, DNI wasn't really baked into people's really um, their work day uh, in terms of cadence of meetings and interactions and engagements that laddered up to uh, pro, you know some measurable progress. And then, lastly, challenge was you know we needed to further demonstrate that DEI could ladder up to larger business growth and goals uh, for the company. But we did find also there were some unique opportunities being that we had a really engaged executive core who are really focused on making sure that DEI works. Uh, employees who generally are really eager and willing to participate in DEI, uh, a focus on uh, diverse teams leading uh, in the digital transformation uh, was important to us, knowing that um, publishing and educational publishing specifically is really moving towards with virtual and digital solutions, a new frontier and how I'm having more diverse teams and inclusive approaches. Uh, everyone's really excited about how DEI can support that. And then lastly, within the Macmillan sort of family of companies between our trade side and our side, finding some unique, uh, there are some unique opportunities um, uh, being able to both ramp up our DI initiatives and collaborate together in the future. With all of that observation, we created, you know, uh, with the input of our executives and some interviews that I've done with um, with um, key key uh, individual contributors, of a real uh, vision statement, which is to boldly lead in education by driving innovation through inclusive design, our products by creating a workforce reflective of our diverse communities of learners, our people, and by cultivating a culture of belonging where all are valued, which is our culture. You know, under you know, our, these three key impact areas, this is really how we design to, to operationalize our work, right? And deliver on um, our DEI strategy and its vision statement, um, right? With our products, you know, we, we, our mandate to ourselves is to take bold steps to assure that our products and services consider the backgrounds, needs, and challenges of the communities of learners we serve, right? Settling for nothing less than being innovative, curious, and inventive, and collaborative in our approach to problem solving, right? Which is really about making sure we're taking in inventory of where there's opportunity to do better at being more inclusive in the way we design our work, which leads to our product, uh, our, I'm sorry, our people, uh, which is really our mandate to ourselves to make sure that we're intentional in our efforts to attract and retain top diverse talent, right? With defining diversity as diversity in perspective, diversity in skill and diversity in thought, right? And that we're mining not just for diversity on paper, which is representation, but making sure that we're, we're, we have the right 
platforms and opportunities for people to engage and ideate and present what's unique about their perspective and contribution. And then lastly, our culture, uh, which is our commitment to teaching, discovery, and social responsibility uh, as we cultivate a culture where everyone is respected and valued for their experiences and contributions, where we encourage our employees to speak up, maintain a growth mindset, and feel a strong sense of belonging. And this is really not just about making sure there's the platforms for our people to express their experiences and their contributions, but that when, we, when they do, they are valued, right? So we have a culture where people can speak up. Um, there isn't um, sort of a um, retaliation culture that exists in a lot of companies and fear of being able to um, express and explain both challenges and opportunities that you're experiencing in the workplace. Thank you, Coltrane. That's a great overview of um, what we're doing here at Macmillan. And, um, you know, panels like this are a part of changing our culture and helping contribute um, to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the higher education space. So I'm glad that we can do things like this. Um, I would next like to introduce uh, Josie Nardo. Uh, she is at Stanford University and I will let her go ahead and, and speak about her and her background and what she studies. Hi everyone. Uh, yes, so my name is uh, Josie and I am a postdoc at Stanford University currently. And I'll just tell you a little bit about sort of my background and you know what I'm doing at Stanford currently for research. Um, so I grew up in South Florida. My parents are uh, both from Cuba. I'm first generation American. And I did my undergraduate at uh, Florida International University where I majored in chemistry and I also got a writing certificate. And then I went to uh, Purdue to study chemical education research. And so I got my master's, my PhD there. And I mostly worked with, um, I mostly like content wise worked with inorganic and physical chemistry. And then for my education research, I did a lot of teacher training and pre-service elementary teacher work uh, for my master's. And then I think we can go ahead and move on to uh, my dissertation work. Um, but basically my dissertation work looked at how uh, the graduate uh, program at Purdue professionally developed students of color into becoming professional chemists. Um, and so I did that by looking at the uh, relationship between the institution, which at the time, which is the chemistry education program, or sorry, the chemistry uh, program and how students um, related to it. And then by uh, using sort of a mix of qualitative methods, um, I learned that unsurprisingly that the, the actual program itself is not very effective for uh, students, especially students of color. Um, and at Stanford, I'm currently doing work with um, trying to understand what the equity challenges are in creating active learning spaces. Um, and so that's specific to marginalized students, so students from historically marginalized backgrounds, racial ethnic groups, uh, first generation students, um, low income students, students with disabilities, students who are neurodivergent. Um, and so, yeah, that's basically me in a nutshell. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to um, answer your questions and also to be working with my colleagues Tisha and Coltrane. Um, on this. So I will go ahead and pass it on to Tisha. Yes. So um, whereas Coltrane is coming from a corporate perspective and Josie is coming from a research perspective, uh, we have Tisha Mendiola Jessup here from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, who is actively in the lab teaching and developing curriculum. I'm sorry, Josie, I missed some of your um, <laughs> great visuals earlier. Um, Go ahead, Tisha, introduce yourself. Yeah, Hafadeh, hi everyone. My name is Tisha Mendiola Jessup. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am, uh, I'd like to actually start off with, uh, you know, my foundations, uh, since this is, you know, sort of a DEI in the chemistry classroom. Uh, I'm originally from Guam and I 
came to the mainland US when I was 15 years old and finished high school and went on to get undergraduate in chemistry and then a master's degree in teaching, uh, all stayed in within my Colorado Springs community. And I am currently a senior instructor in the chemistry department at the school I went to, did my undergrad at, so uh, keeping it in the family. And I, prior to COVID, uh, I got a leadership opportunity in the chemistry department to assume the role of our general chemistry lab curriculum coordinator. So it is a role in which I am responsible for the team of instructors and graduate teaching assistants to deliver the lab content and the laboratory experience for our general chemistry students, which is a pretty diverse population of students. I also work very closely with our introductory to chemistry, biochemistry and organic chemistry lab curriculum coordinator who those students are really focused on healthcare promotions and nursing. Their, their track is in healthcare, where our general chemistry students really run the gamut of STEM majors, including engineering, uh, chemical, mechanical, electrical, and computer science. And then we have our biology majors, our pre-professional majors. Um, we have a large military population. We have students who are uh, we have a lot of non-traditional students, uh, those who are older than 18 when they uh, complete their first year. We have a lot of working parents. We, it's the, the need for us to address chemical and chemistry education for the students who were actually in our classroom and not some model that we're all sort of used to teaching became really, really important to consider in addition to all of the uh, other information that we teach them about the connections of chemistry outside. So one of the most important things that we realized was, a, was an opportunity, it was to see our students as change makers. How do we go from this sort of academic mindset to students who see themselves actively participating in taking the chemistry education whether they are chem majors or not, it, you can be a communications major, an English major, or one of the STEM or STEM adjacent majors. How do you see yourself applying these concepts that we're teaching you to the wider world and these wider sustainable development goals? And one of the things we landed on was teaching through the lens of green and sustainable chemistry in conjunction with the UN sustainability goals. So we, we distilled it down into how does everyone, everyone in this room, safety first? How do we impact change? How do we develop a culture that aligns with the UN sustainability goals and some climate change work? How do we take those historical events that have historically and presently marginalized folks? How do we take these diverse groups of experiences and bring your experiences so that you actually see that the the applications of chemistry and safety actually impact your specific community. So we ask our students to really reflect on the knowledge, the theoretical knowledge and the practical knowledge that they're learning in the classroom. And how do you make that something you use at home or in your major, or how do you impact change in the world because you know a little bit more about chemistry? That's great. Thank you. So I'm actually, uh, these are some of the questions we're going to cover, but I welcome questions from the audience. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen so you all can see our panelists' wonderful faces. I'm not exactly sure whose faces you can see and who you can't. So uh, I think facial expressions, nodding, nonverbal cues are all very important in a discussion like this. So I want to make sure you can see everyone's faces. Um, but my first question to the panel is, what are some inclusive teaching strategies and practices that instructors can easily implement in their classrooms, like baby steps, maybe? Tisha, do you want to start? Since yeah, sure. The classroom? Yeah. The, some of the easiest things that I actually started with that didn't require a lot of 
um, education, background, research, reading the literature, attending seminars, uh, was, as you can see on my name here in Zoom, I attached my pronouns. So understanding just, just the recognition that someone may not identify with their external appearance, um, and they may identify as something different than what you think is really important. So I deliver my pronouns and I invite my students to deliver their pronouns when they introduce themselves. The other thing that I implemented very quick and easy is when I give examples, uh, for example, you know, so and so measured this much water and added it to this much, you know, create a solution. I remove gendered pronouns. Uh, from all of the questions. So they are either gender inclusive, the they, them, or they are, um, I use the name of the student. I try to include diverse names from different cultural backgrounds. So it's not the same um, Joe and Susie that you j tend to see in, in some sample questions. Great. Josie, any thoughts on this? Yeah, and just to follow up, I think one of the, the biggest things, I guess, for active learning is when we think about group work, it's often, um, you know, hey, students get together, whoever's closest to you and work on this. Um, but there's there's ways that we can structure group work uh, to make them more effective for students, such as establishing um, group norms and also um, making sure that we are uh, rotating roles. So having students have roles in, in the group work um, and making sure that they are rotating them depending on, um, you know, how they're moving through the course. Um, another thing, if you have smaller classes, um, is sort of trying to like stagger students based off of incoming preparation. Um, if you have access to that data uh, from your, your university, mostly because what happens sometimes is that when you are grouping students based off of where they are, just sitting together, um, students will kind of like divide and conquer the worksheet <laughs> and so as a way to kind of combat that we can um, look at their incoming preparation and make sure that there aren't too many students with for example like advanced chemistry ap course coursework um, sitting with students that don't have that and then are moving much quicker um, try, trying to get the worksheets done um, and on tisha's uh, point two about pronouns i think it's a really important thing at the beginning to just share who you are about you yourself um, a lot of the things, um, a lot of ourselves are not identifiable, right? Um, and so connecting with your students, at least maybe putting these things in the syllabus um, is, is important, I think, for at least like baseline <laughs> that you could do. That's great. Um, and that kind of, Josie, what you're saying about group work kind of leads me into a question about community and developing a sense of community in the STEM environment and making students feel included and represented in the scientific community. Because I know a lot of times students from diverse backgrounds don't see themselves represented um, in the scientific community or have trouble thinking about themselves as scientists because they don't see that in their daily lives. Um, any comments on how we can make students feel included, feel like scientists and feel like part of the community? Yeah, there's actually, uh, so something that we're starting at Stanford or we're trying to is essentially like a chemist per lesson. Um, so we have like a three person model. So we have somebody from the past, um, somebody who's currently at Stanford doing research and someone who's like just a contemporary like um, person doing research that covers similar topics. Um, and we try to make sure that we have students from, or we have chemists from diverse backgrounds and also just explaining um, certain things that don't get covered in history. So for example, like uh, John Dalton was colorblind. Um, and so trying to just explain a little bit more about the, the background of the chemists um, so that it's known that, you know, yes, they found all these amazing things, but it's also part, like their backgrounds are part of themselves. Um, and I also just want to leave some space because I know that probably Tisha and Coltrane have some ideas too, but yeah, that's something we're trying now at, at Stanford. That's great. Tisha or Coltrane, any thoughts on how we make students feel like scientists and part of the community? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, this, this theme of identity is very important, I think, for all disciplines. And there is this myth 
that science is in being a is um a quote unquote pure discipline in that the way that it is taught and the way that it is accessed should be in some ways sterile and void of um these um social constructs that um that we've created um and to this the concept of being pure from social construct is um impossible right because people identify as it's been said, as Joseph said and others, um, it is an important part of our identities and our identities are an important part of how we, um, our sense of, in, of engagement and curiosity is associated with seeing others who have gone first, right? So it's a very social process to identify with those who've gone before you. It relates to your history, your heritage, your background, but it also allows you in the construct of majorities and minorities um, marginalized and and those who um, who who um, have privilege, it allows all of us to have some sense of center, uh, where we can say that we belong to some joint sense of what it is to be scientists, what it is to be practitioners, what it is to be theorists, and that all of us have some level of engagement because we see ourselves represented in a diaspora of those who have contributed. Right, and that's very important for those who are marginalized, that there's a sense of hope or um, aspiration that can be resident in the early stages of your development and your learning, which as we know, there are two stages for that and that's home and the classroom. Oh, that was well said. Thank you, Coltrane, for, um, that's profound to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I will try to keep this brief because I can talk a lot about this. This is one of the ones that um, having that sense of community is really important. And I will try not to get emotional, um, but it was actually really, I'll share a personal story. Um, I went to a Guam history because uh, I'm, I'm from, I'm an indigenous person from the Chamorro Islands. Uh, that has experienced a sort of continuous 500 year colonization, um, uh, European colonization, and I'm coming to my roots. And one of the things that was really, that, that kind of hit me hard, because I'm in my 40s, is I went to a history conference and there was a woman from Guam with a PhD. And for the first time, I'm gonna try real hard, <laughs> but for the first time I was like, wait a minute, and I'm 40, I can get a PhD? And I'm not really sure why it never hit me until this moment where I saw someone who looked like me with a PhD and we called her doctor. And I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> wait, I could be a Chamorro woman with a doctorate? You know, and so there's that there's that intellectual side that like, you know, Coltrane, what you just said about that sort of sterile environment of understanding the world. I, I understood that, but I did not emotionally understand that. And um, so the, the three big things that I'd like to say is that please do not shy away from addressing the issues in the classroom. If you have something to say, your students do want to hear it. Um, because they take the chemistry home. They're consumers of chemical products. They're con they are, they drink water out of the tap. <laughs> they, they, they require energy for their vehicles to get to and from school and work. Like these things, uh, chemistry and chemical education impacts them on many levels, not just the classroom. And so, so I do, in my personal journey, I dove into social justice in the chemistry classroom, and um, it, I took away a lot of really great lessons. And one of the big ones was the idea of rightful presence. How do you create a space that the student can bring their knowledge into your classroom, their knowledge of their community, their community's needs, wants, and their community's issues, how do you let them elevate that voice of their community in context of the concept that you're learning? And that, that was really amazing for me. So we redesigned about half of our, uh, what we call extension activities, where they are specifically asked about how a concept we're learning, 
chemical equilibrium in the ocean, which is not easy, right? But why does that matter to someone in Colorado? Why does that matter to you if you live by the Pueblo Reservoir? Why do you care about chemical equilibrium in the, in the Pueblo Reservoir? Why do you care about it if you live next to the Colorado River? Why do you care about it? And, and we make them ask those questions about their specific communities. Um, I do not shy away in, in our chemical equilibrium example. Um, we're talking about Flint, Michigan. We're talking about redox reactions. We're talking about chemical equilibrium. And then we're talking about what happened in Flint. And we're talking about the state of water, which I think is the UN um, sustainability, sustainable development goal number three. And we're talking about water. We're talking about it locally um, in the US and then internationally. And how does that all apply? Um, the, the other thing that's really profound to me is, again, going back to elevating those voices. I was, uh, I was in a class about health and human development, and I was able to look into a, a particular disease that's only found in Guam, and my teacher gave me permission to do that because it was kind of tangential to the actual assignment. But I'm really glad she did. And she actually invited me back to give my presentation to the next class. And lo and behold, there was another tomorrow woman in this room. And she's like, wait, you're talking about me? <laughs> you're talking about people where I'm from? And I'm like, it, that, that meta moment, just so you know, like that meta moment for me was uh, like also really profound. I was like, I, I just paid that forward again. Like you can see yourself as a scientist because here I am a scientist that looks like you, that shares a similar cultural background. And I, I'm going to share a story that is actually relevant directly to you and, and our community. So uh, when you can, it's, it's really, it's, I think that first step is just doing it and, and making their voices heard, recognizing you've got a community of people in your room and just saying, what do you, what do you wanna know? What's important to you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And as we're talking about having, as we're having an open discussion right now, right, and talking about having open communication with our students and directly addressing things, how do we have an open discussion with our colleagues about creating an inclusive space in our department so students feel comfortable and they feel welcome? Um, I think I want to turn this over to Coltrane first, just because He's done a great job of creating an open environment here at McMillan for us to discuss and creating an inclusive space. So Coltrane, do you have any advice on having open discussions with colleagues about inclusivity? Yeah, so so I think it's very important to, there's two, two levels of being inclusive. Number one is acknowledgement that people come to the same conclusions in different ways. And, and that's even true for learning. And so when we have more diversity, which we want to encourage, and your classroom takes shape with different people from different backgrounds, different stories, these are people who also have different understandings um, and different practices that lead them to science. And so in a majority that you we will find, what we cannot ignore is that people um, who are from indigenous communities, who are from marginalized communities and communities of color in particular, um, and um, women in poverty, uh, to get to an education table to learn, um, we have been told that um, our science and our processes, our pseudoscience are, 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 um, are not legitimate, um, are illegitimate, are, um, um, our practices or our beliefs that are that are to be dispelled and to be ashamed of. Um, but the process of the experience of being marginalized and the experience of being the other often means that you have to arrive at health care, you have to arrive at um, at um, 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 an intelligent contribution, um, consistent behavior and scientific discovery um, by any means necessary. And so, there, so, so by virtue of that, you may have a student who's 17, who's 18, who are, or, or who is 21, who has this very alternative viewpoint 
based on a very alternative path to education. And so we have to be very careful that we don't discount that experience and the heroes that come with these people, with these students to the table. Um, because to discredit their heroes in science um, is to discredit their identity and their community. So, to, so, so there has to be this level of respect and listening even from, from instructors and teachers for the alternative viewpoint, the alternative pathway and the alternative um, 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 standpoint as we even debate and talk about and normalize what it is to learn something new. Thank you. Um, Josie or Tisha, would you like to comment on open discussion with colleagues about how to create an inclusive environment? Um, so I'm not, re I don't really have colleagues when I was a grad student, um, but when I was doing uh, my PhD work, trying to sort of transform um, or make change towards the uh, graduate program, I think one of the biggest things was when I interviewed faculty was asking them, you know, like what were their experiences like? Um, and a lot of them were like, oh, grad school's hard. It's always just hard. Um, but it, it's like, well, imagine doing grad school that you already acknowledged that it was hard but also with these other factors right these other sort of privileges that you you know they these other sort of like oppressions that you don't have right and so i think one thing too is just trying to explain that privilege is not necessarily like making your life easier but just the absence of those barriers right those absence of those systematic those systemic barriers um and i think Part of um, also supporting faculty in making change is to just try to use your own practice as a model. Um, and so showing that it's kind of a, been effective in your course with your students is a really good way um, to sort of be like, look, look how, look how much better my students are. Look how much more like, com you know, comfortable my students are. Um, so I think that's, what I would say is an approach to, to so like supporting people to join the bandwagon. I love that. Tisha? Yeah. Um, I, at the risk of being prescriptive, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that the big work starts with you. It, the the doing the work and I like listening to us today. Thank you very much for being here. Truly, it's please don't stop. Like listen to the voices that, uh, or you know, change starts with listening. I think, and in, in our department, we we started listening and we started asking those questions. Like, hey, let's start paying attention. And I think that's a great place to start. Is who's doing the speaking and who's not? And, uh, you know, what perspectives are being uh, sort of centered in the conversations during department meetings? And maybe, you know, maybe you have an offline conversation with a colleague and they never really speak up in the meetings and their needs never get addressed. I think we have some power and really depends on your department dynamic, right? And your colleague dynamics. Uh, but what I will tell you is when I started to get really motivated about this, I found one friend. <laughs> I found the one person in my department that I could be completely authentic with. And, and, and they started to actually ask me questions and listen to me. So I think it's really important to continue this work, to do the work that, you know, nothing comes easy if you just sit around and and hope that opportunities come to you we have to do the work of asking the questions listening to the responses reading the material um at the acs actually has a giant uh like green chemistry and social justice section of their chem ed journal um so it's it's a it's a good place to start i think to access some of those resources as well if you'd rather read than have a conversation mm -hmm. All right, and I think we have time for one more question, and um, this is something that I've discussed a little bit with this group, but when we think about diversity, sometimes there are some diverse populations that 
are overlooked or may not always be included in the conversation. And especially in the lab space, thinking about um, students with disabilities and those who are neurodivergent. Um, is there any advice on, you know, making those steps in the lab classroom to make them more accessible? Any resources uh, that you all recommend? Josie, I know you had some thoughts on this, so I'll turn it over to you first. Yeah, there's, there are, so I will link some resources as well, but there are a ton of different things on um, the Journal of Chemical Education that sort of talk about like um, kind of apps that students can use to support them um, in either like having a text reader or just if there's colorblind apps. Um, and then also for like physical disabilities, it's in, this, these are things that are um, important to work with the Disability Resource Center on campus. Um, and make sure that like you're um, providing sort of the most updated curriculum. And I think the biggest thing is not waiting for a student with a disability to like be in the course, um, trying to think about how you can either have like a desk in, in the lab or have some sort of seating in the lab that can accommodate students who have physical disabilities um, that need to you know, that, that can't stand the whole time in lab or can't reach the bench um, to do lab experiments. Um, and then there is a lot of work too with neurodivergent students. Um, and I'm not like, we haven't really gone too much into that, but I think part of it too is trying to figure out like, again, for group work, how do we um, make sure that those students who are partnering with other students are being heard and seen and being valued for the contributions they're making um, with each other during the lab. Tasha, do you have any thoughts on this? Yes, I definitely work with whatever disability services uh, folk that are on campus. If you are, uh, you know, encourage colleagues, especially new folks who may not be aware, um, like we switched to a system where we don't get physical copies of their disability letters anymore. It's an email now of the 50 million emails we get. So I like send reminders to my team. Don't forget to double check that you, you got a letter, <laughs> like make sure you're reading them. There is a legal aspect to this, All right? So uh, that's, that's our accountability and responsibility as educators in this system to, uh, you know, really respond to those legal things, but also, it, when you get a chance to take a universal design for learning course or an oer course that includes universal design for learning it really it like i was saying earlier it helps you start asking those questions like wait a minute i for example i put a spectrum up and i was like wait a minute what if my students can't read this <laughs> and so it's not that you're going to be perfect and you're going to be an amazing website designer it's really about that pause and you start to ask those questions. Oh, wait, wait a minute. What if I have a student who, and then you you start thinking about these things. How do I how do I make sure this is accessible to the most amount of people at, at any given time? And that's really the you know the premise of that universal design for learning is that you are taking steps to remove barriers that we all kind of know are there, right? Before the students ask you to remove them, you've already removed them. Um, I think the other, the last big thing is those relationships in the classroom, making sure that we're not, I have a, I have some students who we did titrations and their burettes were really high. And I was like, great, you know what I got? We ordered a bunch of stools and without making it a big deal, I'm like, use the stool, bring yourself up to the burette, stop trying to make the burette work for you. You lift the floor up. Like we're going to defy gravity and lift the floor up. So there's a way to just say, hey, you know what? I already thought about this problem. I already, or excuse me, I already thought about this situation and I made a, I made a solution. Mm -hmm. And so here you go. Um, and already having those solutions in place so that it's just a really easy, you slide the stool over and there's no further conversation. Coltrane, do you have any comments or advice on accessibility in the classroom or maybe how we as providers of higher educational material are addressing accessibility. Yeah, it's interesting you know, that you asked that, Andrea. We have a, um, 
an ERG, our, our com company, an employee resource group at our company uh, dedicated to mental health and disabilities. And one thing that I'm finding as I um, engage that group is that companies have to be very careful in organizations that we don't define um, uh, challenges around assess uh, that we don't define challenges around disabilities and mental health purely by accessibility, right? Because accessibility uh, always often tends to be the areas of uh, different ability that we can eat that are visual or um, or that um, that we can easily solve for through technology, um, so that there is a tool in in essence that can overcome or help. Um, alleviate something physical, but but so many people struggle and or are impacted by trauma, which impacts this, which is this very invisible space that is very dependent on social interaction in order to not just diagnose but understand, right? And so, uh, um, and so as those issues, concerns, and challenges that students might face don't square aren't very visible and aren't squarely in the um, realm of accessibility we just have to make sure that we keep an eye out for the cues even in the classroom to when someone is being challenged by trauma especially how trauma impacts diverse communities disproportionately and that is childhood trauma that is contemporary trauma in a neighborhood the trauma of being a single parent or, or, or raising or um, caring for elderly parents, the trauma of being of the pressure of being first generation something, right? Um, and um, my best interactions in classrooms have been teachers who have led with enough empathy to take time out, whether it be before a class, during or after, to say, Coltrane, how Oh no, <laughs> I feel like we were going to get a knowledge bomb right there and we, no. we lost Coltrane. <laughs> oh, um, I was so excited oh, about what he everything. Was oh. I'm so, I'm sorry. Can oh you no, hear me? yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, I was just saying that these are moments in a classroom for a teacher to whether it be before a lesson um, during or after class to simply take the time to acknowledge what 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 you're just seeing, but the realities of what is happening socially, and the time to ask a stu student, "Are you okay?" and invite the opportunity to see and hear and, and experience and acknowledge what can't easily get at through um, accessibility tools and normalized processes. Thank you so much, Coltrane. We did get the end of that. So I, <laughs> um, I, we are at time. I just want to thank Josie, Coltrane, and Tisha so much for sharing with us. Um, this has been an incredible discussion. I appreciate all of you and all of the hard work that you do. Uh, to bring DEI efforts um, to these students and make them feel included in STEM education, which is, we all know, is so important. So thank you all so much for your time. Um, if anyone has any questions, y'all have my email address. So please let me know if there are any questions after this. I know Josie has shared some resources in the comments, uh, in the chat. So feel free to use those. And thank you to everyone. Have a great day. Yeah.